Greetings and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection. I'm Mike Merwicki, State Representative for the Wyndham Four District of Putney, Dummerston, Westminster. Today's show is dedicated to the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, on November 22nd, 1963. For many of us, that was a landmark event in life. Most of us remember what we were doing, where we were, who we were with on that day when we heard the shocking news. It was life-changing in its tragic sense, but the legacy of JFK lives on in so many ways. In three short years, President Kennedy changed how we perceive ourselves as a nation and with the world. Many, like myself, answered his call to action, to do for others, to do for our country. It was an influence that led me to my work in public service in many ways in youth and community development and eventually to running for public office um, six or seven years ago. Um, JFK also changed our perceptions in many other areas, including physical fitness, how we perceive those who are developmentally disabled, and most especially in civil rights. Uh, his civil rights le legislation, luckily, was continued on and eventually passed by President Johnson. Um, today we will talk about the assassination, though, with Bill Holliday. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Mike. Pleasure uh, to be here. I'm glad. And, um, Known Bill for a long time in many ways, like many people in the area, um, but it was a while before I learned how much Bill has been a student of this event, how long he's been studying it, and how alongside that he's been using it to help educate our children at BUHS. Um, Bill, assuming no one out there knows anything about you, which I doubt because of the many ways that you uh, give to this community. Could tell us a little bit about yourself, where you live, what you do. Well, I'm here in my hometown, uh, Brattleboro, Vermont. I was born here 63 years ago, 13 years old at the time of the Kennedy assassination, and I'm a product of the school system here. I'm teaching at the high school where I graduated back in 1968, just five years after President Kennedy was assassinated, and I've been teaching in Wyndham Southeast Supervisory Union. This is my 42nd year. Well, thank you for all that service to, to our community You're or to our kind, youth. You're too kind, too kind. Yeah. Um, you've been studying this for a long time. Why? Why didn't you just accept the Warren Commission report and say, tragic, let's move on? That's an interesting question, and I'm always asked that question. And uh, I was very, very moved as a 13-year-old when the announcement came on the public address system at my junior high school, you'd call it middle school today, and the principal said the President of the United States has been shot and we're closing the school, we're sending everybody home. And the only thing I can remember, I can't even remember going to the toilet, to be honest with you, Mike. I went home and got in front of a TV, a TV that we had not had for very long, and sat there or uh, lie there on the couch, and it seems like I was there until I absolutely exhausted, fell asleep on Friday night, it was a Friday that the President yeah. was assassinated, and then I was with the TV from the moment I got up on Saturday all day long, just wanted to know everything. Uh, and when they announced they had arrested someone, taken someone into custody, I should say, Lee Harvey Oswald, who was he? Why would he do this? Uh, what motivated him to do this? And I was actually watching live like millions in the nation on Sunday morning at about 12.23 p.m. our time, 11.23 or so uh, p.m., uh, central time in Dallas, they were, they being the police, were moving Lee Harvey Oswald from the city jail uptown about nine-tenths of a mile from Dealey Plaza, which was thought to be too insecure, to a more secure jail downtown, ironically overlooking Dealey Plaza where President Kennedy had been shot. And he himself, Oswald, was shot by Jack Ruby and I watched it live. Yeah. I don't know, you're not as old as I am. You probably no. didn't get to see that. No, I did. Uh, yeah. Not quite as old, but no. in the same ballpark. And, <laughs> right. Um, almost unbelieving what we were seeing transpire right before our very eyes. Um, the assassination, the capture of Oswald, the, the shooting by uh, Jack Ruby, the subsequent funeral as the nation grieved. I remember that funeral dirge as if it were yesterday. Yeah. The beating of the drums yeah. and the caisson slowly the caisson, moving up. The yeah. John Jr. saluting yeah. his father. Yeah. Gone now also. Yeah. 
Caroline there, uh, the only one of that immediate yeah. family still with us. Yeah. So. so take us down a few years, the Warren Commission report comes out. Well, I believed it, yeah. like anybody else. Uh, the government said it, uh, and uh, you believed it. No slam on the government here, Mike, but um, it, it was done by September of 64, so it was done in a short time, even though it's 26 volumes yeah. of information, three CD-ROMs from the old days. That's yeah. become old days now. Yeah. And uh, it concluded uh, uh, without reservation that Lee Harvey Oswald, up in the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository, all by himself, fired uh, three shots with a six and a half millimeter Mannlicher Carcano rifle. It's a piece of junk rifle from World War II, Italian made, bolt action rifle. And that in 5.6 seconds, uh, uh, the shooting was complete with that rifle. A very, very, very formidable uh, charge for anybody to be able to get off shots uh, that quickly with that kind of a rifle. And uh, some literature began to come out, books questioning the official version. Uh, Sylvia Maher's book, Accessories After the Fact, was an early one that got my attention. And then, of all things, our mutual friend Larry Cassidy was working at the Putney School in those days, and they have a project, a spring project they do. I don't know if they still do they that. They do still do that. And they had invited in people from the Assassination Information Bureau to do a series of workshops in the evening. Larry said, if you want to come over, come on over. And I came over and I hung on every word night after night uh, for a week, I think it was. And that's what really got me going and saying, my goodness, uh, what you see is not necessarily what you get in this case. It wasn't too long uh, after that, that was in 1975, that the House Select Committee on Assassinations began its work and it concluded, uh, these are the words of Congressman Lewis Stokes, not my own words, the chair of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, that with 95% certainty there was conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. Yeah. And they did not come to a conclusion, but they opened up in response to critics and found a lot of inconsistencies in the Warren report. So by that, they meant <clears throat> Oswald did not act alone. Or it was not just Oswald? What were they? That's what they were saying, yes. They were alluding to the fact that there had to be more than one shooter. And they looked at things like the Zapruder film, and they listened to testimony that said that the throat wound here that nicked President Kennedy's tie was, in fact, an entrance wound. And of course, Oswald shooting from the sixth floor window right. of a school book depository that was diagonally uh, at 16 degrees over President Kennedy's right shoulder, yeah. and Kennedy's car was on a downward slope on Elm Street to enter the, uh, underneath the overpass to get onto the uh, interstate, uh, Stemmons Freeway. Uh, Kennedy had never turned around in that direction, and so to have an entrance wound here. And then at the autopsy, Paul O'Connor says that there's an entrance wound here and a gaping hole in the occipital parietal area of Kennedy's head. That, how could that be? Plus, when Kennedy is hit in uh, frame 313 of the Zapruder film... Um, Which his, you happen to have. Well, I, I just happen to have it right here if you want to take a look. Yeah. Uh, not at the film itself, but uh, the film itself. A uh, physical copy I've had for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, an 8 millimeter copy, if that catches up. So this up. was a home movie. Abraham Zuber, uh, Zapruder uh, worked at the Dow Tex building, which is across Houston Street from where Oswald worked. Yeah. And his secretary encouraged him to go home <clears throat> on the day of the shooting and get his brand new camera, which he had not brought to the plaza because the weather forecast was for rain and uh, the weather, weather forecast was wrong. The sun came out, it was 66 degrees Fahrenheit and a beautiful day. So she said, go on home, get your camera, bring it back here. And, and he ended up uh, perching himself on a pergola, they call it and filmed the assassination of President Kennedy from the time that Kennedy's car came off Houston onto Elm Street, passed right in front of him, went through the underpass. Yeah. He filmed the whole thing, and it's there. Now, they've broken that out into individual stills, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it was sold to Life magazine, yeah. and in uh, the early 1960s, 1964, I believe, Life magazine, or maybe a little later, ran... Uh, uh, still frames, the government's contention being that the American people 
uh, couldn't take it or shouldn't see it. It was too upsetting to see what happened in the Zapruder film, so they wouldn't allow that. But Bob Groden, uh, probably the world's premier expert on photographic and film evidence in this case, and the first eyewitness call, the first witness, not eyewitness, first expert, called before the House Select Committee on Assassinations in the late 70s, went on the Geraldo Rivera show uh -huh. in 1975, and they showed this for the first time. Uh -huh. And there was a gasp. Yeah. Uh, but I showed the Zapruder film in the multi-purpose room about a week and a half ago at BUHS as part of a, a special day we have every once in a while called Diversity Day. And the kids knew what was coming, and there were gasps, yeah. because some of them had never seen that. Yeah. And it is literally an eye-opener yeah. to see what happens to President Kennedy. Of course, what happens to him is he violently goes back and slightly to the left, which logic would say is the result of a shot from um, in front of President Kennedy and probably off to his right a little bit. Although there's tons of stuff on TV right now yeah. which goes back to the Warren report yeah. and says that it was Oswald. And I've met some eyewitnesses that says it was Oswald too, yeah. in addition to some whose testimony contradicts the Warren Commission. You mentioned there's going to be a lot in media in the next couple of weeks about this, but I think your take on this I see is a little different. You've been doing your own research and not relying on other people, including visits to, to Dallas yourself. How many times have you been, been to Dallas? Oh, I guess maybe in the vicinity of a dozen, but I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. I started taking students in 1998 uh, when one of them twigged onto my interest, himself became interested, Marco Panella, uh -huh. local guy, went to Brown University. Um, he began studying the assassination with me and so impressed a national research organization based in Dallas called JFK Lancer that he applied for a scholarship and displayed his work and he was chosen as the National Student of the Year mm -hmm. for his work with the Kennedy assassination. He was feted with a scholarship, books, transportation costs and mm -hmm. other things to Dallas. I accompanied him. Uh, we've had another student win that award and a third one finished second so mm -hmm. we've had great luck for a tiny town well, school and national awards with the Kennedy assassination. Well, Branch Rickey once said, luck is the residue of design, and I would say it's the residue of good teaching here, too. Well, good teaching sometimes is getting out of the way and allowing mm -hmm. a sharp and a fertile and uh, inquisitive mind yeah. to do what it can do. Yeah. When you started looking into this, what, when did you first start to think the, the Warren Commission is fiction? There's a whole lot more, and what are some of the things you started to find? Well, I'd say, first of all, there's a lot of truth in the Warren Commission. There are a lot of things they got right, but some things were very, very difficult, and they knew the American people demanded answers. You have to think of the time, yeah. too. It's uh, 1964 when it's published, and uh, the Bay of Pigs has occurred in April of 61, the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 62, and tension between the Soviet Union. What if the Warren Commission investigation led to the fact that Oswald, who lived in the Soviet Union, had become a KGB agent and had come here and on behalf of Nikita Khrushchev or the Politburo had killed President Kennedy out of resentment for what happened in, in sure. the, the Cuban Missile Crisis? You and I might not be sitting here talking. Yeah, they may have been the same. Uh, cry out as with Osama bin Laden to go into Afghanistan or wherever he was. Very similar circumstance, yeah. 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 Mm. You started to uncover some differences, though. Well, I did. I, 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 you, you say research, but uh, what I've really done over the years is to find and visit with people who were eyewitnesses in one way or another to various aspects of the assassination. For example, I've talked with two doctors mm -hmm. who were in Parkland Hospital and were part of the team that tried to save President Kennedy on November 22nd, but also Oswald when he mm. was shot on Sunday the 24th. Uh, Dr. Ronald Jones particularly uh, nearly knocked me and my students off our feet, collective feet, when he stood there and said this was an entrance wound. I said, my goodness, you know, a doctor in this uh, this guy has been a career, mm -hmm. uh, deeply respected uh, doctor out of Baylor University uh, Medical Center. And, and uh, that was one. And 
I met Ed Hoffman, who didn't even see the assassination. He was uh, pulled his car over on the Stemmons Freeway near the on-ramp and uh, was standing there, but he could see perfectly into the parking lot behind the grassy knoll. And from there, he saw a man that appeared with a gun and deaf is, uh, <laughs> um, Ed is deaf, was, he's passed away now too, yeah. but he, um, he saw a puff of smoke. And there are photographs of wafting smoke from the grassy knoll area yeah. out into the plaza. And Maybe somebody was having a smoke, yeah. Mike, but on the other hand, he then describes in some detail through his interpreter, Ron Friedrich, uh, how that was torn down and put into a suitcase and handed to a railway man and taken off yeah. uh, away from the plaza in a car that had been seen repeatedly for several days in the plaza. I met uh, Linda Willis, for example, whose father and uh, his, her parents never let her get out of school, but on this day her father took her out of school, she and her, her sister. And her sister can be seen in the Zapruder film, 14-year-old, running along on the far side of Elm Street, down the sidewalk, trying to get President Kennedy's attention. She's in a plaid skirt and a uh, white sweater waving at President Kennedy. And she explained she was just trying to get the president to see her and wave to her. But Linda's standing up at the corner with her father, who's taking film, which Linda and her father both contend was altered after they turned it over to the government and railway cars are missing. In the background of their shots is the grassy knoll. I remember this vividly, saying to Linda, you know, there's a great deal of controversy over how many shots were fired in Dealey Plaza that day. What did you hear? And she looked me right in the face and she said, all I can say is, it was loud and there was lots of it, talking about the shooting. Yeah. She was a 12-year-old kid. So I've met a lot of people. Yeah. Um. There's some controversy to this in that over the years, people have died, disappeared. What have Karate you chops to the neck, people in their 30s suffering heart attacks, uh, people allegedly shot in the back trying to escape from prison. Uh, others contend that the police let them go and said, go on, you're free to go, get out of here. And they took off and then shot them in the back. You know, sh all kinds of uh, wild stories. And these were witnesses or people who had information? Uh, people that could be key witnesses yeah. that ultimately never testified. Yeah. And other people who testified and changed their testimony. And Where did they testify? Uh, were they allowed to testify in their homes where they'd be comfortable or were they brought down by the police department to the police station? Um, some of the witnesses to the J.D. Tippett murder that took place about 45 minutes after President Kennedy was mm -hmm. killed out in the Oak Cliff section of Dallas where Lee Oswald did live, about a mile away from where Officer Tippett was killed. Uh, several of those people, Helen Markham, changed her story. Domingo Benavides was scared to death, got down in his truck and then got up and looked and what he saw, the Davis sisters, it happened right out in front of their home at the corner of 10th and Patton Street. They heard the shooting, saw a gunman walk across their line, uh, their lawn, excuse me, uh, discharging spent cartridges from a pistol. And uh, they weren't sure if it looked like Oswald or not, but they heard the guy say something like, poor dumb cop or poor damn cop, and said he had a wry smile on his face. But even Marina Oswald is coming out today, this week, and saying that she was intimidated into agreeing with the Warren report and now contending 50 years later that um, her husband, former husband, did not uh, shoot President Kennedy. Yeah. So it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. There's a lot of speculation on who was really behind this. There seems to be a, quite an array of possible suspects. Uh, what, there anything are. from the Cosa Nostra to yeah, there are. industrial and, uh, <laughs> interests? Has anything turned up in that area that opens, opens other doors to questions? Yeah, that's a, had I not cut you off yeah. uh, irreverently two or three times, yeah. uh, that's a 30-second to 45-second question that requires yeah. a two-week answer. Yeah. And rather than do what I think Oliver Stone did with his film, and that is come to a quick conclusion, 
and give the American people the feeling that this is absolutely and unequivocally what happened. There are too many avenues of explanation that are required to fully understand, and even then, you would understand who had means, motive, and opportunity, but you wouldn't, and I still don't know, um, who paid if money was exchanged, how high up in government, if at all, the United States government was involved, uh, how intricately involved organized crime was with perhaps dissident anti-Castro Cubans living in what Miami still calls Little Havana today. Um, there, it's just it's too big of an answer for, for a short question. So yeah. I'll, I'll leave that one alone. Well, um, I have seen your, your longer presentation. Mm. Uh, I advise people out there, um, you get a chance. Bill does this on occasion. Uh, it's a really thought-provoking and, and uh, well-documented presentation. You have a lot of artifacts to go with what you've uncovered. Uh, hopefully we can share some of these within the context, context of this as well. Um, what about the... Um, I want to talk about using this as an educational opportunity for our students. Um, mm. This, this is, is uh, some heavy material. How, how, how do you present that in a way that can allow students, as you say, to, to get enough of an inspiration that you get out of the way and let them start running with it? This is the one topic <clears throat> that I occasionally teach, and sometimes it's a day or two, mm -hmm in a broader context of a U.S. history course. Other times we take a closer look when it becomes a subject of a seminar or something like that, and we can spend several weeks on it. Yeah. Uh, but this is the one subject that requires no salesmanship. Uh -huh. There's as much intrigue among uh, high school kids in Brattleboro today as probably I have had for 40 years or, yeah. or so. Um, it is interesting in and of itself. Yeah. And sometimes when kids are finished with it, or we need to finish yeah. with it, it's, geez, can we do more of that? Yeah. Can we do more of that? Uh, you know, you, you, you get the President of the United States shot down in a major American city in broad daylight. And to this day, we don't know conclusively yeah. who did it how many people did it, and who specifically was behind it. And that's intrigue uh, uh, in itself. The broader question that allows for teaching and questioning everything, which is a great way to look at social studies, mm -hmm. social science, don't take anything at face value. Uh, if you have political aspirations and leanings far to the left, then enjoy those and pursue those. And uh, conversely, if you're way over to the right, the same thing. There are many ways different ways to look at things, but um, with this particular topic, you have a president who seemingly was pushing a memorandum numbered a National Security Memorandum 263, which if you read it carefully, you can deduce from it that he was pulling the plug on the Vietnam War before it ever started. Now think about this country. If it did not uh, continue the war, the build-up, uh, the sending of troops on March 8, 1965, landing two Marine battalions at Da Nang, the war rising to the Tet Offensive in 1968, and then slowly dwindling down with the Paris Peace Accords in 1973, and us leaving the last helicopter out of Vietnam on the 30th of April, 1975. All of that potentially doesn't happen, and all the profits that were made from that potentially don't happen as well. Kennedy also said, furious over the Bay of Pigs, I will smash the Central Intelligence Agency into a thousand pieces. And he fired the director, Alan yeah. Dulles, uh, who becomes a member of the Warren Commission yeah. later on investigating the murder. So there's a lot there that kids can see. It also, I think my generation, and maybe yours uh, too, Mike, uh, is when America lost its innocence. Growing up in the 50s, if the government said it, if this was a government test, if this chicken was USDA government inspected, then it was gospel. Yeah. The government has put its seal of approval yeah. on it. And then Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union in an 
a civilian, piloted by a civilian in an unarmed weather research plane? I don't think so. Not so. And then the Bay of Pigs, of course. Yeah. Um, well, let's be blunt about it, where we were lied to and, and then brought to the brink of nuclear holocaust. Then Watergate just yeah. a short time afterward. And I think kids today grow up with a jaundiced view of government. Yeah. And it probably takes guys like you, uh, you know, honest politicians who have gotten into government and do the right thing because it's the right thing yeah. to try to unwind a whole generation, maybe two, of young people who think that government is, well, now you have the National Security Agency yeah. and it's eavesdropping on foreign countries as well as its yeah. own citizens to contend with. So if you can't make something out of that in, in a course in, yeah. in uh, American history or discourse, something wrong with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that tact to teaching. Uh, it's certainly not teaching to the book or teaching to the test. And one of the things I appreciate as we're moving forward, hopefully, with the Common Core, uh, is that there seems to be a re-emphasis on critical thinking. Let's get people thinking for themselves. These are the ideals we need to hold up to prepare our kids for the future no matter what instead of just teaching to a test and hoping they get to good test scores which mean what? Not a whole lot. Really. It means a headline in the reformer. That's right. That's what it means. Yeah. One way or the other people read it and they're disgusted that the school system is not doing real well yeah. or I can't remember the last time it happened that there was a positive reporting. Uh, yeah. But uh, on the other side of that common core thing is um, uh, it is set up, I think, to begin to foster um, cross-communication among subject matters, too, so that math and science yeah. and reading and writing and social science <clears throat> and other art, for example, in music, can join right. back together again, maybe like they were sure. 40 years ago. Use the if, whole brain if we, again. Yeah, oh, if we do a good job with yeah. it. Or the jury's out on whether or not we'll do a good job. Understanding that those are the things necessary also to, to help develop executive function in the prefrontal cortex, which helps us in the all of our The frontal lobe, yeah. as they say. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for your, for your teaching, for your time. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left here in our half hour. Oh, okay. Um, are there areas that people could look at this more? Places that you've, you've found information uh, that you would recommend people who, who want to look into this in more depth? Oh, there are some excellent books done so, by some excellent researchers. One of the sad things about those is that uh, the scope has been narrowed so that if you take a book by David Lifton that was actually written in the 80s, mm -hmm. he's a very <coughs> bright guy and a wonderful researcher and put together the book Best Evidence. But it, it's talking about uh, the assassination through the autopsy and the mishandling and the chain of command with the body. His contention is that uh, President Kennedy's wound, particularly the head wound, was altered between Dallas and Washington. And there's a case to be made for that because a 24-year-old, ironically the same age, age as Lee Harvey Oswald, Al Reich was working for the O'Neill Funeral Home, which doubled as an ambulance service in those days in Dallas, he was charged with the responsibility of handling Kennedy's body after the priest had come and given the last rites to JFK and he was pronounced dead. So he was with his friend, his pal, his working uh, cohort, Peanuts, as he calls him, and they went to pick up the body and Reich's hand disappeared into the massive wound in the occipital parietal area of Kennedy's head. And so he said, Peanuts, you know, we've got to put him down. So they wrapped his head in cloth. In Reich's words, he's still draining. Uh, and so they wrapped his head and then uh, placed him in the casket. And Reich describes the casket as the most expensive casket we had, befitting of the president. They put a vinyl liner in that casket to keep the casket from whatever draining the president's body might experience uh, between Dallas and Bethesda Naval Hospital where the autopsy was done. So he puts them in the best casket they had. You can see that casket being loaded on the airplane. But the uh, 
casket that's received at Bethesda by Paul O'Connor is a common, ordinary shipping casket, not the same casket. And when he opens it to begin the autopsy on President Kennedy's body, the body is in a Vietnam-era vinyl zipped body bag. Al Reich never put it in a body bag. There was no body bag, and there was no crummy shipping casket. So that suggests, and David Lifton is your best source on that, mm -hmm. that uh, that body was taken out of one casket and put into another, and the uh, wounds were altered. Uh, so that's that's just to give you an example. Sure. But but there are lots of others, uh, and some of the older ones are some of the better ones. Uh, believe it or not, like Sylvia Mars' 1964 Accessories After the Fact, but mm -hmm. there have been some great works lately too. There's also some junk out there. Uh, people saying that Bill Greer, the 54-year-old driver of the limousine, turned around and with his pistol shot President Kennedy in the head. And that's a joke. Yeah. That's a joke. So. On the positive side of the Kennedy legacy, um, what do you take away from uh, his gifts to the country and to the world since then? Uh, young people still today have an elevated sense of the importance and quality of Kennedy's presidency, in all probability, in large part, not entirely, but due to the fact that he was assassinated. And he said some things. Uh, he said that democracy is not a spectator sport. If you want to change the game, you need to get in and play the game. So don't sit out on the sidelines and complain about what politicians are doing. Don't complain about what your government's doing. Become active and do something. If you're not happy with what the Congress is doing, then talk to your Congress people, talk to your senators, uh, talk to your representatives in Montpelier. Uh, you'll have their ear. They are interested in doing what you want done, but if they're left to apathy guiding them, then they'll do what they think is right, and sometimes what they think is right is not what the people yeah. think is right. My good comrade Tim Kipp had a sign up on his... Uh, classroom. I think it's still Another there. Another teacher at Brattleboro High School. Uh, recently retired. Yeah. Tim uh, retired just this past spring. But he said, you know, if the people will lead, lead then government will follow. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of people are content to have it go the other way until things don't go their way. Yeah. Then they have a problem. Yeah. Well, I think democracy works when people participate. Um, I think people participate in Vermont probably more than any other place, starting with our town meetings and select board members as people might, another way people might recognize you from the airings of the Dummerston select board meetings <laughs> on Thrilling viewing, VCTV. Folks. I would encourage everyone. Well, that, that's it. But democracy, uh, even representative democracy, is about participation. Uh, it's about people getting, getting together. And I think that's how we're held accountable in Vermont, the way we are and why I think it works as well as, uh, mm. uh, as we can make it work here in Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with you that the legacy of JFK is about getting, getting in the game mm -hmm. and participating, and I certainly uh, wish that for our kids and, and generations to come. So do we. Uh, I hope that every student I've ever had uh, is able to critically think better when they leave, uh, not to be unduly influenced by any teacher in terms of political persuasion, but uh, to have the wherewithal to be able to make his or her own decisions based on some kind of interest that has led to some kind of research or, or better understanding. Yeah. I think That's our, what it's all about. I think our, fond, our founders um, had faith that we could figure it out and if, if we could uh, had the opportunity and uh, that, that's where our uh, mm. moving away from the monarchy to a uh, representative democracy, and I think where we've grown to, I think we're at a stage where we need perhaps uh, some amendment to, to the way things are, because this was a country that was um, much smaller at its founding. We're now over 300 million people, but uh, I think the basic ideal still works, and uh, if people will participate. And we're so lucky here in Vermont. Brattleboro doesn't have it anymore. It's too large, yeah. but when you come to town meeting in Dummerston, yeah. Putney, Westminster, etc., cetera, um, you're meeting the people who've shown up to determine the future for one year of that town. Yeah. It is the purest form of democracy there is, and yeah. it's right here. You, you remember Alexander Solzhenitsyn? 
when he came up in the, the where was he? Cavendish. In Cavendish. Yeah. That's why he came here. He yeah. loved town meeting day. Yeah. Yeah. So they say. Yeah. Bill, thanks a lot. Thanks for your teaching over the years, for the basketball we've had a chance <laughs> to, to share, and continuing on. Well, thank you, too. You keep up the good work in Montpelier. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, you bet. All right. And thank you again for tuning in and uh, this special edition of Montpelier Connection. Thanks again to the good people at BCTV for their work in, in bringing what's happening in the community to you. Until next time, thanks. This is Mike Berwicki. Good night. <laughs>